So this was told to me by an old family friend, Nikki, numerous times as a kid growing up as one of those life advice stories to keep in mind through the years. And to her credit, I've never forgotten it. Whenever anything associated with hitchhiking comes up, it always springs to mind and probably always will. Even makes me a bit ill whenever I think about it, actually. So Nikki, who grew up at the same time as my dad, so this was about early 80s, I believe, she was a young woman in her mid-20s. She's one of those real kind-hearted souls, always willing to help another out in a time of need, you know? And I can't imagine her being anything other than that when she was younger, so I totally see her doing this too. So driving into the city, which was about a two-hour drive from town, she saw a man walking down the side of the road. As she neared, he turned and, in typical hitchhiker manner, stuck out the old arm and thumb. Nikki, bless her heart, pulled over and asked him if he needed any help. She told me he was really polite, if not a bit shy, when he asked for a lift into the city. Nikki gave a smile and popped open the passenger door for the guy, who then tossed his bag into the back seat and buckled up for the ride ahead. They talked pleasantly for most of the trip, about friends, the news, etc. You know, happy small talk. She felt that they were getting along very well, and even bought him dinner at the pit stop a little over halfway there. She says he seemed really flustered and awkward when she paid, but one of the things they talked about was money and how he was pretty damn strapped for cash, which was why he was hitchhiking in the first place. But he eventually relented and they went on their way. As soon as they got into the city, he thanked her profusely for the ride and the food and asked to be dropped off once they hit downtown. Before getting out, he asked for Nikki's phone number so he could contact her one day and maybe catch up. Thrilled at the prospect of knowing how her new friend was faring, Nikki wrote it down for him and drove off with the warm feeling of having done a good deed. Now, I'm sorry if you were expecting something creepy to have happened by now, but I think this is what freaked me out so much as a kid. How nice everything seemed to have worked out. Nikki gets this crease in her forehead and a funny look in her eye when she tells me this next part. How a week later she got a phone call from the same man she had picked up. He didn't let her get a word in edgewise after hello and told her that she should thank God that she was raised so nice. Because when he first got in the car, he was planning on raping and murdering her once they got to that pit stop that he was going to steal that car and dump her body in a ditch further down the road and go on his merry way. But after she talked with him so kindly and even treated him to dinner with a smile on her face, he couldn't bring himself to do it. He didn't think that he could live with himself after doing that to such a nice lady. The man's final words on the phone were, Please, Nikki, please, never ever pick up another hitchhiker. Then he hung up the phone. Nikki never got a call from him again. When she tried redialing the number, she got a payphone. And so, I've learned one important thing from this story. That I'm going to take that man's advice and never, ever pick up a hitchhiker. The Wrong Hitchhiker by Nathan Bartholomew I've learned one thing from my one and only experience picking up a hitchhiker. Don't pick up a hitchhiker. It was a Saturday night, probably around 1 in the morning. I was driving down the 542 in New Jersey, a route I commonly took to get into town. It was a long stretch of nothing but woods on either side with the occasional residence. I was on my way back home from town, and as usual at this time of night around our quiet old town, there was not a single other car on the road. I turned on the off-road lights on my Jeep to have optimal vision on the unlit highway, which allowed me to spot somebody far down the road, just standing at the side. As I got closer, I saw him raise his arm up and stick up his thumb. He was trying to hitch a ride. My heart started racing. I had no idea if I should stop or not. I slowed down just to get a better look at the guy, first of all. He seemed like a younger man, maybe 28. He had on a light gray hoodie with the hood over his head and blue denim jeans. The time to make a decision was immediate, and with a lack of my better judgment in the heat of the moment, I came to a stop, rolled down the window, and asked, Where are you heading to, friend? Just up the road, he said in a deep, quiet tone. 
Hop in, I called out the window. He opened the door to my Jeep and stepped inside slowly. Jeep Wranglers have very tight seals on the doors, so when he tried to close the door the first time, it didn't shut. I politely said, oh, the door didn't shut. Just open and slam it shut real hard. These doors are hard to close. The body language he was giving off in response was unsettling. About three seconds after I had finished my sentence, he looked at me, then turned his head slowly to the right, and again waited three or four more seconds before finally opening the door and then slamming it back shut. By the way this guy was moving, I already regretted my decision to let him in. I put my foot on the gas and we started moving along the road. The speed limit on this road was 55, but I was going 75 just to get the guy to his destination quicker. So, uh, how far did you say you're going? There was an awkward gap of silence before he replied with, just a few miles up. I wanted to turn the radio on to kill this awkward and downright creepy silence, but something in my head told me not to for whatever reason. Suddenly, I could see just through the corner of my eye that the man had turned his head and was staring in my direction. At this point, I was telling myself that I needed to get this guy out of my car. For a good mile, I felt his gaze just hitting me like a brick, and all the while I tried my best not to look back. Finally, he turned his head the other way and said, You know, I've been wondering for the longest time if it's just worth it to end it all. I looked at him in confusion. He dug his hand into his pocket and said, I've been carrying this knife with me for the past few weeks, wondering when the right time would come. He pulled out a big red knife from his pocket, and at that instant I felt like my stomach had dropped out of my body. I told him to put the knife away immediately. He told me in a calm, emotionless voice, pull over next to that sign. I did what he said, coming to a stop next to a speed limit sign, and what followed still haunts me. He began to slit his forearm next to three other scars from previous assumed self-inflicted cuts and let out a disturbing moan. I managed to choke out the words, You need to get out of my car right now, buddy. He looked at me again and said, Get out of the car. I want to show you something. I told him no, and he raised his knife up closer to me as an obvious threat. Just get out for a second. There's something I want to show you behind that sign. I knew my life was on the line and I had to be smart. I said, yeah, okay, man. Let's go. I opened the door to my Jeep, making a point of leaving it open, raised my hands in the air and backed away slowly from the door. He too left the car and started walking over to my side. At the exact moment that he was directly behind the car, I jumped back in, threw it into drive, and floored it down the road, never looking back. I got back home within ten minutes, still breathing heavily and wanting to throw up. This was the scariest thing that has ever happened to me, and I urge everybody and anybody that if you by some chance see a hitchhiker on a dead road at some odd hours of the night, do not take any course of action other than speeding right past them. Three months after I turned 16 in 2005, I got my first car, a 99 Toyota Camry. On a warm Saturday night, when my friend Alex invited me over to one of his friend's big parties, I knew I wouldn't be in a condition to drive the Camry home afterward. So we carpooled with Alex's girlfriend, Brianna. We lived in the countryside of Virginia, meaning less big parties. Meaning when there was a big party, it was a huge deal and everyone would go. We lived about 5 to 10 minutes away from this kid's house. I knew where he lived as I was acquainted with him, but not exactly friends. The whole ride there, we took the same two-lane highway type road through the woods, and this kid's house was actually on this road further down. At certain points on this road, there were a few houses on either side, and then it would just go back to being a long, empty highway again. 
The house was tiny, like a lot of houses around the area, but the party was held outside anyways, since his closest neighbors were relatively far away, and noise wasn't an issue. I'll skip most of the party up until the point that Brianna, who was supposed to be our designated driver, had to suddenly leave for a small family emergency. Alex said it was fine and that we'd find a ride home. Well, fast forward another few hours and another few drinks, and I could barely even walk straight. I checked my watch, and it was like 2 in the morning. I figured it was time to go. I started looking for Alex, but I couldn't find him anywhere. In fact, it seemed like everybody I knew had already left. I could barely even think straight, but I was still furious at the fact that Alex could have actually left without me. I asked to use the party host's phone and dialed Alex's home number. After two tries, I gave up and then realized I shouldn't wake his family up. So, literally not knowing what else to do, I dizzily stepped out onto the road and began walking back home. I knew this walk would take anywhere from half an hour to an hour in my condition. Maybe after 15 minutes of walking down the road, the slight shine of car headlights on the road was fading in from behind me. Jumping for joy inside, I lifted up my arm and stuck out my thumb. As the car neared, it slowed down and came to a stop right next to me. The man driving the 98 Ford Explorer rolled down the window and asked where you headed. I told him my house was just down the road and beyond a right turn, probably slurring my words beyond comprehension. He chuckled and told me to hop in. I thanked him and joyously hopped into the truck. I was exhausted, and I remember completely disregarding things the guy was asking me because I was so close to just passing out. And that's what happened. The memories of being in that truck turned to a fog as I'm sure I passed out. The next thing I remember, I woke up still in the moving truck. The guy looked at me and left, but didn't say anything. I looked around and realized the road we were on wasn't familiar. I nervously asked, uh, where are we going? He then said, so what were you doing out this late anyway? As the man answered my very straightforward question with another irrelevant question, the sobering reality of the situation hit me. Uh, you can, you can let me out anywhere, I told the man. The man responded with a firm no. I felt like throwing up as he said that. No, I really actually felt like I was going to throw up. I started to gag as I felt more and more nauseous by the second. The man took his eyes off the road to look at me, and that's when I thought of the perfect distraction. I turned in his direction as I continued to gag, and he started to kind of lean away and slow down the car. Thankfully, I drank as much as I did because I finally threw up and made a point of doing it all over the man's lap. The man yelled in frustration and stopped the car, and that's when I took it upon myself to run for my life into the woods and duck behind a few bushes. The man came following into the woods with a flashlight, and on two separate occasions, he shined the light straight over me without noticing. Eventually, I heard his footsteps walk even further into the woods past me. That was when I ran back to his truck, but unfortunately, he was smart enough to lock it. By some miracle, I saw another car approaching in the distance, and I ran out into the middle of the street, waving my arms like a lunatic. The car tried to avoid me, but I wouldn't let it. They were forced to stop, and I yelled at them to help me before they came back. Once I told them that I was kidnapped by the man who was driving that Ford Explorer, the driver agreed to give me a lift. Not to the police station or anything, but to my house. I made it back safely where I couldn't thank the driver enough. I immediately woke up my parents and told them. My dad wanted to know if I got his tag number, and then I felt like punching myself in the face. I failed to get the simplest information from the guy that would have allowed me to actually properly report him. All I knew was that he drove a faded blue 99 Ford Explorer. I made sure to give Alex a piece of my mind, and part of me always held a grudge against him ever since just for abandoning me at a party without telling me. I haven't seen him in four years now, however, and this was actually the first time I even thought about this incident for almost a year now. As time goes on, even the worst of memories may start to fade. But after writing this to share with the internet, it's once again fresh in my mind. 
Thank you so much for watching and we hope you enjoyed, but be sure to keep those lights off and tune into the video that Mr. Nightmare and I have done on my channel about horrific hitchhiking murders. You can either click on screen now or in the description below to watch that video and be sure to subscribe while you're there because you won't want to miss what's next.